Hi everybody and welcome back to On The Roof. Today we have with us esteemed guitarist Stanley Jordan. Welcome so much Stanley. Thank you Scott. Thanks so much for coming. Here. <laughs> yeah, we've been waiting a while to get you up here. Mm -hmm. So um, let's just start at the very beginning. Where did, mm -hmm. how did you get, how did you find music? I've been playing music, man, pretty much as far back as I can remember. Uh, we had a piano in the house, and my sister tells me I was playing when I was three. <laughs> I don't have a lot of memories from age three, but um, I remember my, when I was around five, uh, my, my father showed me how to make um, cartoons in the margins of books, like each page you draw a little slightly different picture, yeah. and you flip the pages, you know? Right, right. And my mom had shelves and shelves of books, and I had pretty much free reign my mom's book so I used to make these little cartoons you know and they were they were epic stories I mean some of them would take like 15 books for one cartoon you know <laughs> and my number one character was Griffy Grasshooper and so it was mostly the adventures of Griffy Grasshooper okay and and so the first song I remember writing was was Griffy Grasshooper's theme <laughs> And uh, that was something that I played at the piano. But I wasn't taking lessons yet. Right. I was just kind of absorbing things from watching my sister play and watching my mom play. And um, So, you know, it wasn't like a regimented thing. It was just something that I did because I loved it. And you know how children are really creative naturally. Right. You know? And I think it's important when that is, is supported and nurtured. Oh, totally. Mm -hmm. But would you say you are uh, were like a prodigy? I guess, I mean, I just sort of did what came naturally to me, and I think that maybe I had a comfortable enough situation, not like we were rich, but we weren't struggling in a huge way economically, right. and, and so, um, you know, I think, I think the, the potential that people actually have is way beyond, you know, what, what we even know, you know, so... Yeah. I, th I consider myself to be lucky enough that I was able to cultivate the potential that I had. Now there was one period when things weren't as good, when my parents got divorced and suddenly there's no piano because neither one of them could keep the piano and so um, that's when I started playing guitar. Really? Yeah. Wow. Now there was some other catalyst to that as well because I was starting to get interested in music that was very guitar oriented because because I had been more or less a sort of a pianist sort of composer who liked kind of sort of late romantic early modern stuff you know? right and but I but I was starting to get into a lot of blues and rock and R and B and, and how soul old? music and stuff so this was around the age of eleven okay and. Then I remember when I was 11 and I was sitting in a doctor's office and I saw there was a magazine and they, there was an article about um, Jimi Hendrix, that Jimi Hendrix had died. And it was just such a shock, like, what, really? Yeah. And I pretty much decided then that I wanted to play guitar, you know, because, I mean, you know, we have to keep the tradition alive, you know? Yeah. You know, not, not like I... Wanted, I mean, I, I wanted to be, um, to develop into an artist in, in my own right. But, um, you know, it was Jimmy that really inspired me to want to play guitar. And Jimmy was the first guitarist that I emulated when I was a child. I don't and know. That's who, why I started. Yeah, every great guitarist, you know, pays tribute to Jimmy, you know. Mm -hmm. But, um, I, I mean, and not just because you're here, but I've seen you do it in your way. And it's, it's, it's some of the greatest stuff I've ever heard. Oh, thanks. Well, you know, I have this new project that I call Stanley Plays Jimmy. And we're currently um, arranging some live concerts for this. But so far, I've been just 
fitting it into some of the shows that I already do. Right. And the idea is, it's my, it's my fantasy Jimi Hendrix concert if he were still alive and playing today. Right. So, so I'm, it's a tribute show, and I'm, and I'm trying to embody his, his personality. And I'm, you know, I'm yeah. going on stage as Jimmy. So it's a, definitely a, a real okay. tribute show. But there's room for creativity, too, because I'm imagining that this is Jimmy today. And, oh, okay. And, and so, so there's still room for me to be creative. And because it's filtered through my, my yeah. view, my fantasy of what I would like to, yeah. to, you know, to see Jimmy doing today. So it still is going to have my sensibility and my ideas there. Right. But I'm definitely going on stage as, as Jimmy. That's, that's a yeah. trip. Oh, <laughs> pay attention, man. We got to see when that's coming up. You know, but what I what I got out of that when I saw you do like I, I was telling you the, the Red House version you did it at the Iridium like I think it was like two years ago, was it was you doing it like you know like you you play out of the box anyway and Jimmy was never in a box I mean he wouldn't mm -hmm. like allow it it seemed like right mm -hmm. so what you did was you were you doing him and I mm -hmm. saw that throughout the whole thing mm -hmm. and it was like you freestyling his way. I don't know how to even describe it really, mm -hmm. but it wasn't somebody playing Hendrix note for note or just like you mm -hmm. went and did your thing, like mm -hmm. almost like he influenced you and now you're out there ripping. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the other thing is coming from the jazz background, I think that that helps me to feel comfortable with taking m music from other artists and just going ahead and doing it my way, you know, because right. that's, that's what we do in, on the jazz side. Improvise, anyway, you know? yeah. And that's a really important point because. Um, when I was fairly early in my professional career, and I had just recently signed with um, Blue Note Records, and the great Bruce Lundvall, he was the one who reactivated Blue Note back in the 80s and got the label going again. And in fact, I was the first artist that Bruce signed to, right. to Blue Note. Right. And he made a really interesting observation when he saw me play. He said, you know, um, I noticed that you take some of these more recent popular songs and you play them as standards. And I thought that was really interesting because it never really occurred to me that I was doing anything unusual because I just thought, well, that's what you do in jazz is you take popular music and, you, you know, I mean, you can do your own compositions, but when you're taking popular music and doing your interpretation yeah. of it, you go ahead and you take whatever songs appeal to you, you know? Yeah. And what I didn't really get yet is that there's the whole kind of um, repertory of the, the classic Tin Pan Alley compositions right. from the Great American <laughs> yeah. Songbook. But the more recent songs that I grew up with were not considered part of that. Right. And so I didn't get that, like, you weren't supposed to take those more recent songs and do that. It's only supposed to be the older songs. Right. And so Bruce made the observation that I was doing that. I didn't realize it was anything unusual. And then I started noticing that I was getting criticized for that by some of the, the jazz purists, you know, saying, you know, what are you? Are you a jazz musician or are you just somebody, somebody playing pop music? Yeah. And then it brings up the whole idea of, you know, if you're jazz, if, you, if you're in jazz, you're not supposed to make money. You're supposed to be struggling. Yeah, you know, as yeah. If that's really good. Good. Yeah, that's for great you. business. <laughs> <laughs> Let me choose that. Give me some of that. Yeah. yeah. So you know, I mean, I don't want to veer too too off the point, but the main thing is is just that when I saw that I was getting criticized for that, that's when I realized that okay, this really is something unique and 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 new. Nowadays, it's. It's, nowadays it doesn't matter. Everybody plays those songs, you know, and in jazz it's fair game. But at the time that I started doing it, it was considered radical. Yeah, and you got auto-tune jazz out there too, you know. It's, I mean, anything is, you know. But you know, like Miles, when he was always outside the box and he was always improvising. Mm -hmm. Coltrane, my favorite things. I mean, that's an improvisation. Mm -hmm. I mean, and he's a classic jazz, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, legendary songs, right? I mean, you do it um, somewhere over the rainbow. How many mm -hmm. people have not, you could count, it's easy to count the people who have not recorded that, mm -hmm. but your version of it stands out to me, oh. clearly. I was, I was complimented by Henry Mancini for, for um, Moon River, so that, you know, I mean, yeah, wow, me. I mean, yeah. Well, you know, because um, we were talking about Jimmy, you know, yeah. and, and I apply that same approach to, to doing Jimmy's music as well. To me, 
that music is fair game. And it's always been fair game because I played Jimmy's music and music like that before. He I did a lot played, of that too. Before I even played jazz. You yeah. Know? And, and so the thing that the jazz brought to me was this idea that you could take a song and, and really make it your own and that that's okay. And it's funny to think back on that now because, you know, back in those days when I was really getting started, there was a changeover going on in the music industry because the, the, the industry, the recording industry figured out that they could make a lot of money selling simple music to really young people. And there was this huge market with the baby boom, you know? Right. And so, so what they did coming from the sort of corporate mentality is let's just crank out music that's easy to hear, easy to understand, easy right. to like, and mass produce it. And, and so then this big rock thing was born, you know? And so I was born into that, listening to, yeah. to that, to that yeah. music. But at the same time, I was coming from Stravinsky and Prokofiev and, and the classical stuff. So the thing that I loved about jazz was that jazz gave me that element, that raw element that I liked from the rock music that I was, that I was brought up on. And it also gave me the sophistication right. from, from the classical side. Right. Um, so, so, but the, the, this is the part that I find that this, that's kind of funny is that, okay, back in those days, because of this changeover that was going on, a lot of the older jazz musicians were kind of bitter because they saw that, you know, these rock people were coming up with an attitude um, who had, you know, half of the education, if that. Yeah, if that. Um, um, and had this, this pride, we're moving you out, we're on the vanguard, we're the cutting edge, you guys are old, the old fogies, you know, right. you don't matter anymore. You know? Right. And, and the funny thing is that now, it's kind of switched around because, because when I do a song like, like Stairway to Heaven or something, sometimes people will complain because I'm not doing it the way that Led Zeppelin did. So now it's now it's re turned around because jazz is, is the one with the attitude, you know, and, and is, is ascendant and is telling the rock people like like move aside, you know. This yeah. Is, let me show you how it's done. Well, you know, I mean, in rock and roll, I mean, to be a rock star used to be something to really strive for as a kid. You dream like, wow, who doesn't want that? Mm -hmm. It's not what it was. Mm -hmm. It's really there's a lot of grind out there, like oh, for these man. artists to start now. It's it's a totally and different even a lot game. of the artists who've made it big, you know, but they tell you have the to go early back. stories. Yeah, oh, that's true too. They, right, they paid a lot of dues. Yeah, too, yeah, know? yeah. You know, and and I mean, you know, every style of music brings something valuable to it. So I'm not trying to play the game to to say that one style is ultimately superior. One style might be superior in certain respects and not in others. You know, right. I mean, this is the way you have to do it nowadays because we have so much different culture coming at us from all directions and we have to find a way to, to um, relate to all of that. And I think people yeah. do that naturally, but I'm, I'm fascinated by how people are able to do that. And I think that what we do is that we don't use the same criteria for judging all music. We, we find the criteria that fits the music that we're listening to at the time. And and so, and I think sometimes, I think that there's, I don't know if crisis, maybe that's too heavy of a word, but, but I do think that there needs to be an evolution in the um, field of aesthetic criticism when it comes to, to music. Because you've got these sort of different islands that don't talk to each other. Yeah. And, well, you, you know, need some more Lou Reeds out there who just bashes them all. <laughs> just give a <laughs> fuck, man. <laughs> His rants were, to me, legendary. But, you know, like, you, you, you kind of bridged the gap to that. You seem sensitive to that criticism, and yet you went out and did your thing regardless. Like, yeah, you, you're finger tapping. Your style is well, I think I'm totally I yours. Think I'm, I'm, I'm sort of naturally sensitive, just as a human. Right. And I think that's part of where the power of my music comes from. Right. Right? Um, but at the same time, um, you know, we're talking about you get different things from different styles. So right. one of the things that I really got from, from the rock side is um, really bringing the attitude. You know, rock is a, is a vibe. It's, a, it's an attitude. And even people who 
you know, um, I never met Jimi Hendrix, but a lot of people I talked to who knew Jimi, and they said Jimi was really shy. But then he'd get up on the stage, persona, and he knew how to bring that attitude to, mm -hmm. to the music. You know, so there's value in, in that, too. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. How were you influenced mm -hmm. by blues, and how important is oh, that to man. you now? Well, you know, my the first guitarist I emulated was Jimmy, you know, and he had a background in blues, of course. Yeah. But the first, my first, I'd say, guitar hero that I love to listen to was B.B. King. And, mm -hmm. and you know, B.B., um, um, I mean, I felt like a kid. I mean, I would go and I would show up at his shows. I went to so many of his shows, man, even just, you know, just the year before he passed away and stuff, I was going to, to see him play. Right. You know, and um, I, I can just remember every moment of every time I went to see him play. And, you know, so, I mean, and, the, you know, there's something about that, the power of the blues, you know. Um, I don't know how to put it into words. I don't have the words for it. No, but you but, know that, that's the gift that you have. You don't have to. You can just you can the take. best people like like what BB King could say with one note. Yeah, you know. Yeah. 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 Who came after him? Like, it, do you have any peers, like, you know, that you would say like, that's great. That guy, you know, he, he has it or she has it. Oh, that's a lot of great artists. I mean, you're talking about it. I mean, style who, who touched you and you you you, oh, know, you go like, uh -huh. wow, you know. Like they could, they might be my peer, but I can really, you know, I would, you know. I mean, as the names come to me, I can mention I'm Emily Rambler, um, Vicente Amigo, um, Paco de Lucia, <laughs> just to name a few. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> you got me there three times. I'm out. The next batter. <laughs> yeah. These are. European, South American, where, where are they American? I, I, I'm, so, excuse me for my ignorance. So Paco um, was from Spain, I believe he was from San Sebastian. And in fact, I got a chance to see him play in San Sebastian. Wow. And, you know, I mean, he was considered the greatest flamenco guitarist. Possibly, I was gonna say, when you said Spain, Possibly yeah, the yeah, greatest yeah. ever, I mean. You know, and when he did the, the trio, with John McLaughlin and, and Al Demiola, it was just legendary, you know. Mm. And um, so to get him to, to, to I mean, to, to to see him in his hometown, in his sort of natural habitat, if you will, you know, and his kids were in the audience, and I mean, it was just a great experience. Um, and I felt like I could just see, like, the the colors of the. I could lit, It was like a synesthesia. It was like an acid trip synesthesia or something mm -hmm. like his notes were just cascading color you know and the colors the colors that he would pick in were just like he would just pull out and it's a it, you know one time you know when you go to Europe you do a lot of tours and a lot of times they the festivals coordinate so you you take trips from one festival to another so I, I was sitting on the bus with him and we were just sitting there talking for a couple of hours. And at one point he said that he had, he was curious about learning theory and learning to read music, but he was kind of afraid it might mess him up because he had learned with, without that. Yeah. And, and so he didn't want to, you know, learn now and then... Like his creativity would be and then, compromised? And he, yeah, he was, he was kind of concerned. That, so he kind of figured, well, I'm d doing fine as I well, am. This so. was working out pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah it yeah, was yeah, working yeah. great. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, um, I, I've studied music theory a lot. And I actually have some, some issues with the conventional system that I learned. And so I'm actually, I kind of don't blame you in a way. Um, but just from my own complaints about the conventional system, I came up with another way of approaching um, mapping out musical harmonies. And so I basically showed him my system. It uses numbers. It's, it's kind of mathematically oriented. Um, and he, he got it instantly. And he said, oh, man, if they had taught me like that, that would, that would have made a lot more sense. And did you just take what you learned and simplify it? In a way, I did, yeah. I mean, some might disagree 
because some might look at it and say, well, I see a lot of numbers and stuff that looks like equations and stuff. So yeah. they might think that that looks more complicated. It's a different notation. I think that the thing is the conventional system, it, I'm not going to say that it's not mathematical. It, we could say that, that it is in, in many ways, but it's the mathematical aspect of it is kind of um, obscured. It's sort of covered up, and so it's not really as simple as it, as it could be. Like, for example, if I take this note, um, C, now that's considered the, the one in conventional harmony because it's the first note of the scale, so you're counting the notes. So if I go, one, two, three, four, five, so this, this is considered the fifth because it's the fifth note of the scale. Okay. Okay. So that's all fine, you know, because that's an ordinal number, the first, the second, the third, the fifth right. is the fifth note of the scale. Okay. But once you call that interval a fifth, now you're starting to confuse things because because the, now because now you're measuring distance. You're not counting notes anymore. You if you say interval, you're actually measuring the distance between two notes. Right. And when you when you when you measure, you should start from zero. See, when you're counting, you start from one, but when you're measuring, you should start from zero. Because, because otherwise, it messes things up. Like your ruler, if you look at a ruler, the ruler actually starts from zero. Yeah. Right? Right. And, and that, makes more, that makes more sense. So did you just bypass that? Like you didn't get stuck so on I that? So I started from zero, and I also, okay. instead of just basing it on the major scale, I, I base it on all the notes in between, what we call the chromatic scale. And this is something I started doing when I was 15. And I had a math teacher, I showed it to my math teacher. And my math teacher said, oh, um, that's called mod 12. Cause you use the number zero to 11. Yeah. And so that gave me a good insight how to follow up in that. And so I really developed that. And then <laughs> when I got to college, it was freshman week. And I had met someone who like me was sure that she wanted to be a music major. Right. So we were like really getting into talking about all this deep music stuff. And I said, I want to show you this system that, that I invented. And so I showed her the system and she said, oh, um, Milton Babbitt already thought of that system. And I said, really, how do I find out more about him? And she said, he teaches here. <laughs> <laughs> so I had no idea. So it was like a perfect thing. So, so um, I, I did get my, my undergrad in theory and composition. But this concept was original to you, even if it had been done by well, somebody well, else. It's Milton not like you learned it, I did, but, but you I, didn't learn it. I figured it out on my own. Right. And I had a different motivation because because Milton, yeah. his approach was based on primarily on what we call 12-tone music or serial music. Serial is kind of more general, let's say, than 12-tone. And the idea is like like... It's, a, it's an approach to doing atonal music, where the music is not in any particular key. And in fact, uh, Ken Wilber pointed out rather brilliantly that this whole idea of relativism came up in many different areas or all around the same time. Because Schoenberg, Arnold Schoenberg was considered the sort of the, the inventor of the atonal style, at least in, from the West. And um, he, um, just was working up to it and then just went off the cliff and just said, okay, I'm abandoning tonality for my whole career. Wow. Well, well, around that same time, we had Picasso doing um, Cubism. You know, on the philosoph philosophical side, um, Derrida, I don't know how to pronounce that name, but talking about this whole idea that... that um, we have context within context, and there's no one context that's ultimately um, absolute. Um, and and so, so this whole idea, you know, in Einstein, the theory of relativity, you know, it's all kind of the same idea. Right. And in the musical side of it is, like what, what a tonal center is, is, is when you have one note that becomes referential to the other notes. So like if I start with a C, All the other notes are heard in relation to in right. relation to that. 
But once we um, go outside of that, like I can go like, um, um, suddenly, you know, we don't have that reference anymore. And so the, with, the, with atonal music, we get rid of that, that reference. And so, so um, once, we, once we get rid of that, that reference, it makes the point that there is no ultimately, you know, um, favored con context. Right. So when Schoenberg did that in music, and Milton Babbitt was Schoenberg's student. That took student, the leash off you. When Milton was, was Schoenberg's student, and he came up with this, that system because that system made it easier to... Um, see, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't want to veer too far into the technical no, no, yeah. aspect of it. Okay. But, but I was just pointing out that Milton came up with this with this the system for studying the music of people like Schoenberg, um, Webern, and and people who did this atonal thing from the serious modern classical. I know we have, always have difficulty with these terms, but um, you know, I was doing it for pe people who were very advanced in a similar way, but on the jazz side. Right. So people like Cecil Taylor, people like Ornette Coleman. Um, Sonny Chirac, you know, um, these were such John, late John Coltrane. So I was looking for a similar thing, a system that, that could go beyond the, the conventions of the past and describe some of the music that some of these bold new artists were, Which were, were be playing. Absolutely innovative. So, so in one in one level, it was the it was the same, but there was a lot of differences too. It, it came yeah, it grew yeah. from the same seed as Milton's system, but it went in some other direction. And did that experience validate what you were doing? Like when you hear, like, oh, this, this guy's teaching right here and he's got a similar theory to what I, where I'm at, that means mm -hmm. I'm really, really onto something. I'm working on a uh, concerto for guitar and orchestra. And one of the main models in terms of the orchestration side of it is um, the concerto for orchestra by Bela Bartok. And I carry this score with me um, pretty much everywhere I go. And that this system using the, the with the numbers has been really beneficial for me. Wow. Because because you know he throws some shit at you that's like, what <laughs> is that? Yeah. You know, and it doesn't fit the conventional classical tradition. But you can and it doesn't it really out. fit the jazz or pop musical tradition either. It's like he's created a whole new a, approach to harmonizing a melody right here. And it just sounds amazing. And it sounds like music should have gone like that all along. But I don't have a, a, a reference for that. So I just say, okay, this system makes it possible for me to pretty much catalog anything that can happen. So it's very useful for that. Yeah, yeah. When you get, like, you're, well, identified with the finger tapping, the style you got, where did that come from? Basically from piano. Because I mean, I, I played guitar conventionally for like five or six years. And then I started to experiment with the instrument because I started wanting to, to play piano again. Like as I advanced in school, I started to have access to pianos again at school. And I started playing piano again. And I realized that there were still some things that I liked about, about the piano, but by that time, I was way into guitar. I was really, I knew the guitar was going to be my main instrument. Right. But I missed some of the possibilities of, of the piano. So I was looking for a way to bring some of those possibilities to the guitar. And in fact, um, I was also very much interested in electronic musical instruments and the sounds that you could get with electronic instruments. I remember... Besides the guitar, or you mean primarily with the um, guitar? Well, regardless of what the controller is, okay. it's the fact that the, inst that the electronics can generate these sounds. Okay. You know, and just from having watched a lot of sci-fi movies, and I was a fan of, like, Pink Floyd, but I mean, like, early Pink right. Floyd, when Same they were like, really, yeah, 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 yeah. like, exploring the universe of sounds on the synthesizer and stuff like that. Right. And basing a lot of things just on that, you know? Yep. And... Um, so anyway, I wanted to, to you know, go join that part of the musical world. 
And so I started to um, look for ways that I could, I, could, I could do that as well. Well, synthesizers all had keyboards attached to them. So that was another thread because I would have had to go that way through the, through the keyboard. You know? right. And then the other thing is I noticed that there were certain voicings, certain chord voicings that you could play on a keyboard that you couldn't play on a guitar because of the way that the strings are laid out. Um, like, for example, there's a lot of cluster voicings where you have the notes really close together that are difficult to hit on guitar unless it just so happens that you can use a combination of open strings and fret, fretted notes up here and stuff. It's, it's, you know, there's some possibilities, but it's not, you can't do just anything. Right. And so I realized that if I were not limited to one note per string, then I could play any of those clusters, any of those piano chords. So it occurred to me that if there were an instrument that were logically laid out like a guitar, because that's what I knew, I knew the neck really well at that point. Um, they were logically laid out like a guitar, but physically a keyboard. So it's not strings and frets, it's a matrix of push buttons. Then I could push those buttons and that could be a controller for a synthesizer, and I could also play it independently with both hands. Let, let me let me interrupt you for a second. Are you saying that it's it's a perspective shift? Are you looking at that no, neck I, and I, seeing another way to do it? Yeah, but I, re, I realized that if I had this instrument that I was fantasizing about, then I could play any of that pianistic music. I could play the synthesizer. I could play all these interesting chords okay. that are hard to play on guitar or impossible. All those worlds open up. Um, if I had this instrument that was a matrix of push buttons. Okay. And, and so at that time, I set out to build that instrument. So I already knew enough about electronics to build the electronic aspect of it. Because the, the environment where I grew up, there was a lot of high tech. It was the area that they now call Silicon Valley, which is a whole other, other story. Because um, um, my dad was actually very... Um, I would say influential in setting the stage for how things worked in Silicon Valley because he was the first personnel manager at Hewlett Packard. And the culture, the sort of culture that, that encouraged creativity and innovation, he was a part of developing that. Wow. But anyway, so um, that's another subject, but I grew up in that world too. So the technical side of things and building the circuits and all that, I already knew how to do that. Wow. But I, what I didn't know was the, the construction side of it, working with wood, plastics, and materials, and that aspect of it. So right. I set out to learn that so that I could build this instrument. And I realized I needed some time to get that together. So in the meantime, while I was developing that, I decided, well, let me see how closely I can approximate this concept on a normal guitar. So I can't play more than one note on one string, but I could maybe play independently with, with both hands. <laughs> you know, maybe there's a way to do that. So I started trying it and I went through maybe like four or five different stages to figure out how to do that. And I realized it was partly a matter of adjusting the instrument so that I could facilitate the physical execution of it and also make the sound really speak and, and, and ring out more clearly. And so I did, I figured it out on guitar. Now, since then, other people who had the same inspiration about the matrix of push buttons followed up on it. So I ended up not having to- <laughs> You were able to go buy one. Invent that, yeah. I, I mean, you went and bought your years idea. Years yeah. later, you know. Wow. I didn't have to- But, it, but that idea was born out of that, what you, what you were able to do here, and yeah. you seem to perfect it. I mean, right? It's beautiful the way you can play notes like that. I mean, it's just like, it's so pretty. Well, you know, it does change the sound, too. It's yeah. a different sound, and, and I love this sound.
yeah, there's just so much there. I mean, and now, now you know, having this opportunity to see the, all the vast areas that you, you get to draw from, the different styles of music, and that you really, you really get in there. I mean, like, did, you, you take jazz on a level that, that very few people, you know, do, including your own peers and other jazz musicians, right? And then, and blues and the flamenco, all of that. I mean, there's just so much influence there. And you can hear it in the way you improvise on a song. What I try to do when I improvise is I, tr I do try to be true to the song that I'm playing. So, right. like, um, this is an idea that's, it's an old idea, but, for example, Herb Ellis said, when you, imp when you play your solo, um, your, the solo that you play should be compatible with the melody of the, of the song that you're playing. Okay. You shouldn't like go off, I mean, I mean not, you know, not that he was trying to tell people what to do, but the point is, is that that's the approach that he took. Right. And that really inspired Keep me. Keep some they, uniform. Yeah, so, so like if the melody's playing, let's say it's over the rainbow, and the melody is, is playing, and Herb Ellis is doing his solo, you'll hear that his solo perfectly right. is compatible with the melody. Or another way to, to, to think of it, and I, this is the way I like to approach it a lot of times too. Imagine that, this is a slightly different idea, but it's in the same ballpark. So imagine if the melody to Over the Rainbow continued. Imagine if like the part that we got was only the first part of it. You know, like right. Jabberwocky was only, we only got the first part of that. There was like right. way more. So imagine the melody, the, the real melody actually continued. Going so in. where would it go? Where right. would the rest of that melody be? Right. So when I play my solo, I'm trying to play <laughs> that, the rest of that melody. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, I get fascinated with stuff like that because I'm just watching you perform. Or any mm -hmm. performer perform. And then you wonder, like, why they go there. And I'm left to just wonder. <laughs> mm. And when I, you know, that makes total sense. Mm -hmm. And as an artist, I could see you just, you know, letting your skills go. Well, and like, you know, the other night um, when I performed in um, Ir Iridium, right. and I was doing Fragile by Sting, you know, yeah. and there's a whole message in, in that song, you yeah. know. And, you know, basically um, nothing comes from violence. If, if I were to boil that down right. the most, you yeah. know, because we're fragile, you know. Right. So what I did is I, I sang the song and I played it in a more or less conventional way, you know. And then when I went to improvise in a, at Iridium. So I did the song, you know, more or less, you know, conventional way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I go into this really intense section where I'm really trying to depict the violence and the battle, the war, the conflict and all, and all of that. And so a lot of that music that I learned from studying the atonal stuff and, you know, they use a lot of those um, compositional techniques in the scary movies and all that yeah, kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, right. You know, so some of your sort of more complex and more advanced harmonic structures, they can lend themselves to that. Yeah. Um, and so I, I go there. And I, and I use it for that. And you might think, well, what's, what, what's going on there? This is destroying the song. It's destroying this beautiful song. Then I come back. Right. As if this final act was meant to clench a lifetime argument that nothing comes from violence. So, oh, so it has a meaning right. in the context of, of the song. And this is what I'm, what I'm saying, is I try to work within a, within a song. So if there's something that I want to play, and then, and, and if it doesn't fit the song I'm playing, then I should play a different song. If, if, I, if I really want to play this, mm -hmm. fine, but I got to put it in a song that where, where it actually fits. Right. And just as a person who really values composition, arranging, mm -hmm. um, you know, that sensitivity is burned into my blood, you know. Right. Um, you know, and, and I think in jazz, you know, there's a tendency of a lot of players to just sort of go off. Um, now, if, if that's the idea, if you're, for example, if it's a free improvisation, mm -hmm. um, you know, or if you get moved by the spirit, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all for that. But what I still, what I try to do is I try to tell a story um, and I try to use what I know um, 
to 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 make it coherent. Right. Um, rather than work against the song, I try to work with the song. Right. And That's I think like in doing so, you separate yourself from the pack that way because you put your stamp on it. I also really have a a real love for melody. Mm. And um, some of my favorite players, like one of my favorite guitarists um, was uh, Hank Garland. And Hank Garland did this one jazz record. So we had Gary Burton there on, on the album. Anyway, this was um, not long before he was supposed to play at the, at the um, Newport Jazz Festival. And then they had to cancel the festival that year. And he didn't end up playing in the festival. And then he got into a car accident, which ended his career. Wow. So wow. people don't know that Hank Garland was like this amazing closet jazz guitar player. But if you hear, if you go find that one album that he did, it's amazing. Wow. And, and he had all the chops. He, you know, I mean, they knew him from Nashville and all that kind of stuff. And he was a master of that. But here's my point, is that from playing all that country music where melody is so key, and also the story, it's a, it's a storytelling art. Yeah. And, so, and so that's the world that he li lived in for all those years, is telling a story through his guitar. So he had all the stuff, all the chops of, a, of, of any jazz gu guitar player you can mention. But the way that he pulled it off, he always had this melodic sensibility about it. And so I would have to say he was a huge influence for, for me in that way. Every time you come to New York, you play the Iridium. Do you do that purposely? Is the, is the Les Paul, like to honor Les Paul? Is, that, is there I anything love to Iridium, do with that? You know, and yeah, I used to sing room. with Les, you know, the Monday nights with Les, you know. Yeah. And so there's a lot, of, a lot of history there, you know. Um, you know, it's not the only room I play, though, in New York. Right. You, know, you know, unfortunately, New York is a big city and... and I know people say that the scene isn't what it used to be, but you know, there's still yep. other venues and there's, there's other things to do. Um, Iridium certainly has been the, the place I've played the most, and you know, that's I'm definitely cool with that. You know, yeah. and um, I do feel that through the years we're developing something. You know, because I have people who come and say, you know, I've seen you many times and yeah. I enjoy following the evolution and I see you developing yep. your concept. Yeah, and you keep, like it's almost an annual thing when you're going to be at the Iridium. Yeah, you mm -hmm. come in and you do other venues, but Stem's going to be at the Iridium this year. You can basically <laughs> bank on it. And that's a great thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I also did this thing, you know, because um, I've been fascinated by the relationship between music and the natural world. And, and so this time when I played at Iridium, I did one improvisation based on the ionization energies of the element iridium. And the idea of it is when you have an atom. Man, you're deep, man. Wow, <laughs> man, you're deep. This, this is real. This yeah, is real I, I believe it is. <laughs> um, when you have an atom and you have the, the nucleus and you have electrons orbiting the nucleus, the ionization potential is the amount of energy that's required to strip an electron away from that atom. And as you work your way in, and you strip more and more electrons away, it requires more and more energy. Because, because you're getting closer and closer to the nucleus. And so the remaining electrons are more con attracted to the nucleus. Plus, you've already removed other electrons, so there's less competition. So the field, the attraction, is that much stronger. So that increasing series of energy levels can be converted to an increasing series of frequencies. Because mm -hmm. at the quantum level, in the, in the, in the quantum um, world of the photon, energy and frequency are proportional. And you use Planck's constant to, to do, this is a simple calculation, but the it's point simple. is... I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm with you. It's a, it, <laughs> it's a simple, the calculation is not a big deal, but the point is, is, is that the note that you get is is a really high note. That's so high, there's no way that you can hear that note. Your dog couldn't even hear it. It's just a okay. super high note. So you go octavely down. You know, you go like You just go octavely down. But you have to go down like something like about 45 octaves. Then you get it into the range that people can hear. Can actually hear. And the note that you end up with, the first note you get is a B. 
And so B natural, we, we round it to the nearest note that I have on my instrument. That's how I always do it when I'm playing it on guitar or keyboard. So the first note's a B, and then the next note is a B flat. Then we have a G. Develop that and eventually you get this. And you just get these gorgeous scales, and that mm. that scale, that beautiful sounding scale, you know. Just strange and beautiful and delicate and fragile and yeah. just amazing. That is something that comes from the, the natural properties of the element iridium. <laughs> you shared that with these people? Yeah. Any, anybody walk away with any comprehension <laughs> of that? Because I don't. Yeah, I, I, really? Well, there was some validation because there was a chemistry professor from <laughs> NYU who came uh, to the meet and greet. And I don't said, have to feel like he said, he said all the science was correct. So that wow. was good, good validation. Right, right, right. <laughs> well, you know, I mean. I, I would. I, I can't thank you enough for giving me this time and us this time. For, you know, and and. Well, I'm glad we finally had a chance. Finally to had a chance to do it. We've been doing it yeah. quite quite a while. Um, could you would you be able to take us out with something? Yeah. And, yeah. and I just wanted to say the one thing that impressed me so much uh, when I saw you at the at the Iridium one time, and you were playing the two guitars and and mm -hmm. jamming with yourself on the piano and the guitar. And it's just, you know, you're awestruck watching this and, and you just like gently walked over to the mic and just said, you know, people ask me, you know, why I do this. And because I can. And everybody just went, yeah. <laughs> you know, it was Funny, just beautiful. I, I mean, you just, I don't remember great. saying that. I, it, like, it I'll, I won't forget sound it. sound to me like something I would say. Yeah. But sometimes if I'm being silly, I might say something like that. Yeah. yeah. But it, it just, to me, it reminds me of a joke, which I won't. Repeat. But. Yeah, it, it reminds me of how you exemplify this complexity, and just, like for you, it's just second nature. And and mm -hmm. I, you know, I I can sit there and watch in absolute awe. Oh, I'm going, you know, how do people do this, and how do you do that? Well, you know, it's, it's just so beautiful, man. Yeah, you, know, you know, one time I did, I played a, a concert, and this critic in Boston was kind of grumbling and complaining about the concert, and and he said, you know. Why does, you know, Stanley Jordan, when he's playing his guitar and he's playing with one hand and then with the other hand, he reaches over and he picks up a cup of water and he drinks water. Why does he do that at the same time that he's playing guitar? The reason is because he can, you know, and it was like this complaint that I had somehow gotten away from being dedicated to the music and I had become more of a showman. Than like a you're disrespecting or something the music? Like I mean, the, the implication is. Yeah. Um, but actually, if he had actually bothered to ask me, you know, because I'm a human being who has a story and you can actually yeah. talk to me, yeah. the reason that I do, did, did that is, is because what happens is when I'm playing and I get thirsty and I make a mental note that <laughs> after this song, I'm going to take a drink of water. And then I forget and I start the next song. It's like, oh man. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm gonna drink water after this song. And then I start the next song, oh shit, I forgot. Again. Yeah. It's like, okay, that's it. I have to- I'm dehydrating over yeah, here. Yeah, right. I gotta drink the water. I'm gonna drink it now. So I pick up the glass and I drink the water. That's why I did it. The answer's always a simple <laughs> one, man. Yeah, 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 that's great. All right, so you're gonna take us out with something? Yeah. What are you gonna do? So um, I composed this and performed it in the, in the movie Blind Date with okay. Bruce Willis and Kim Basinger. And, um, it was fun because they sent us the, the uh, script and, and said um, we would like to see if Stanley's interested in, in being in this movie. You know, Blake Edwards wrote the script. Right. And um, I just loved it. I thought this was his, hysterical. This is going to be a hysterical movie. I would love to be in it. Right. And so, anyway. It's the scene and they're on the blind date and this is the scene where they first realize that they have some real chemistry. They're finally able to sit and talk and in the background I'm there playing. Okay. Um, in, the, in the story, Bruce Willis's character and, and I were friends. 
So he takes her to the studio where I'm playing. Um, that's to kind of, you know, impress his date, you know. Right. Um, you know, look who, look who I know. You right, know? right. And so, so anyway, so I play this, I play this song. And we did, we did the scene live. So while they're talking, I'm actually playing this song. Okay. It's called Treasures. named that's a treasure it's amazing how music could just 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 creates another space transcends everything you go in there and then you, you come back oh, wow where was i <laughs> yeah like nothing else yeah and you know that's really needed these days i mm -hmm. feel because i think that it's really easy to get caught up in the in the grid the whole matrix you know yep. and Forget that every moment is precious. Every moment is unique and special, you know. And I think the value of the of the arts, especially the live arts, the performing arts, yep. is it makes that moment so special yep. that it brings you out of your head. It gets you out of your head, and it really brings you into the moment where you're fully present and experiencing your life more completely. And if you can carry that over to the rest of your life. I think it has benefits beyond the aesthetic. There's there's a sort of a, a healing benefit and a spiritual growth benefit as well. Mm, absolutely, man. Mm. Even I know that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's that's profound. That's why I'm just forever a big music fan and yeah. trying to put my drop into that ocean. Yeah, <laughs> you certainly are, Stanley. I, again, thank you so much. This was really oh, this was a treat. You're welcome. My, my right. pleasure to be here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.